Hello everyone, my name is Adam Michael Anthony Simpson and you're watching my YouTube channel, Adam M. A. Simpson. And so let's, let's, <laughs> let's um, shift into the second half of the interview, which is um, all about uh, how your work impacts society. So I want to be clear with viewers as you study religion. Can you first explain to us what you study and um, what your biggest interests are in? You kind of explained this before, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I study religion, um, and people, people love to ask me about that. Like, oh, what aspect of religion do you study? And I guess I would say um, religion as a component of like identity mm -hmm. creation. And again, I look at religion as the lens with which people understand and view the world. Yes. Um, and I say that. Uh, Tongan epistemology, the way in which they understand the world, um, is shaped by religion. And in that case, religion, what I mean by religion, is a Victorian era Methodist, um, a Wesleyan Methodist Christianity. Oh, okay. So it's not Catholicism, it's not technically Mormonism yet. Um, it's Wesleyan Methodism. And uh, it's a particular kind of variety of Methodism that comes out of Australia. Oh, really? And so it starts in, yeah, so it starts in London. You have London missionaries traveling to Australia and settling there. And then yeah. they they flood the, the Pacific with, um, with, the, with their Methodist missionaries. And so, um, yeah, it's a very particular type of Christianity that um, is introduced there. And so, yeah, yeah. when I'm asked about religion, um, I like to get very specific about what I'm talking about oh, okay. uh, with Tongan. And so it's that the specific that type kind of religion. Of like, oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that like strain of religion, because there's like okay. tons of religion. Exactly, right? exactly. And um, I looked at, and I, I look at um, lived religion. And so mm -hmm. it's like how, how people practice and what they say about their practices, what it makes them feel about their practices um, and their beliefs. And so it's not necessarily, like I don't sit there and I, I don't judge. I don't like, I'm not, and I'm not also not saying that I'm like super objective. Um, my <laughs> position is very subjective. It's yeah. very biased. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I come from my own positionality of being, a practitioner of several um, Christian kind of institutional institutions. Um, oh, so then, okay, can I and, ask you what, and, could and, I ask what, what, what kind of denomination of Christianity do you um, practice? <laughs> or you're, are you, or are you like non-denominational? So I was steeped, steeped, I was steeped <laughs> in um, Mormon and Seventh-day Adventist practices. Oh, wow. Wow. Those uh, are two different. My, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so different. Yeah. Um, so my mom, my mom is Mormon and my dad's Seventh-day Adventist. Yes. And, um, I went to church like all week. Long exactly. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> draining. <laughs> it was so draining. Yeah. And, um, like I... I was in high school going to seminary um, every morning before school. So in California, wow. it's different in other places, but in California, we would go, it's kind of like Sunday school. So we would go to Sunday school before school wow. every day from like six to seven o'clock in the morning. Wow. And then my high school started at 7.20. And so we would get out at seven, we get 20 minutes to get to school. And this was like every day for four years. Um, wow. My mom was more invested in it than I was. <laughs> and, um, and she would like bribe me with donuts and like, wow. <laughs> to get me to go. And I was like, yeah. um, you know, when I realized it was voluntary, I was like, why am I doing this? Exactly, yes. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah. And then my dad's seven day of Venice. And so like, one of the largest things that like shocked people was like, I didn't eat shellfish or pork 
Oh, until uh, like my mid twenties. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "You've never had bacon." And uh, I was like, no, no, I don't eat. Yeah. I don't eat. I don't eat swine. Uh, and, um, but let me tell you, when I did though, when it I was had so good. Life, it was so good. I yeah. was like, "It's been all my life. Yeah. This mm-hmm. is so good." Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, oh, the devil swine, but it's just like, <laughs> mm. um. <laughs> Sorry for the break, but I just wanted to advertise my art prints. Yes, I'm selling merch by selling my art prints. And here are two uh, pieces that I uh, painted. These are acrylic on canvas board. So very thin canvas boards. Um, but I did these during the lockdown in 2020. And um, yes, the, I will be putting out new merch and I'm soon going to create an Instagram account just for my art print. So please check out the link here, somewhere here, it will be here, or um, in the description box below to check out my art. Um, I love art and I'm trying to, you know, develop this entrepreneurship, you know, thing. So please support me by buying my art prints. Okay, back to the interview. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so I was, I was kind of doing that. And then I was actually, I was never baptized in the Mormon church, but I was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church when I was like 22, I think, mm-hmm. or 23. Um, and my mom was like really upset about it. She was she was heartbroken, you know? She's like, how, how could you do this to me? Yeah. Um, but anyway, when I was at UC Riverside, I was really trying to find myself spiritually. And so that's probably the reason why I was taking so many religious studies courses. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I was really trying to like take this introduction to um to the to the old testament new testament because i was like i'm gonna read the bible and i'm gonna figure out what it really says like Mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna get to the core of like the 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 real spiritual message or something like that and um and yeah let me tell you i didn't find (laughs) i mean you got more confused or I got more confused and more critical, you know, oh, and I yeah. think it's like the introduction of um, colonial studies or post-colonial oh. studies, neo-colonial studies, um, the advocacy work, and um, and I think all of it just kind of wrapped up into each other, um, made me sort of look at the real life implications of colonialism mm. and Christianity as colonialism in the Pacific. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, I think that hard look just, <laughs> it just, yeah, that it spiritual changed. journey. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, but maybe I'm still on a spiritual journey. Maybe exactly. I, I still am. And it's just kind of the point time. where I'm at right now. Yeah. You're just, just more critical like about it? I think so. And I think, so I, I don't, I don't say that I'm, I'm, I'm atheist. I don't say that I don't believe in God. Um, you know, I call myself agnostic um, because I like the phrase, I don't know. Um, and so when people tell me that they can they can tell me, you know, with 100% of their being that this is true, like, I just can't. Maybe I can tell you, like, with 39%, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, that other mm-hmm. 61% is, like, telling me, like, I'm not sure. And so mm-hmm. I, I roll with agnostic. Um but my husband, um, his mom is a, both of his parents actually are Methodist preachers. And so, um, Whoa. and so yeah. that's why you're into Methodism now. Um, kind of like Tonga period. This is where, exactly. this is the original Christianity yeah. that was introduced as Methodism. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of, uh, my my in-laws being Methodist is more of a symptom of Christian, Christian, okay. Christianization okay. All right. cool. in Tonga. Um, but it, it, to me, it, it's not really surprising for any like Tongan Methodist to, but yeah, so both of my <clears throat> in-laws, my, my late father-in-law was a, a pastor and my, my mother-in-law is a pastor, um, in the church. In the sorry, Methodist sorry church. to hear about your father-in-law. Yeah, he was, he was a really, he was a really fun guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he was, he was a, he was a pastor and 
And so um, I I help my mother-in-law out a lot. Um, I, I copy edit some of her newsletters of her church and sometimes like um, some of her, and, and it's great. And so she's always asking me like, oh, you should, you know, you should come and, and speak in church. Oh my God. I don't know if you're allowed to hear my. You don't want. <laughs> <laughs> I said, girl, uh uh. You don't want me to go. <laughs> I, 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 and I love that we're having this. And this conversation is actually differentiating the scholarship from the, the practice which I think is yeah. Um, yeah. It's important to differentiate here uh, because I think um, many viewers might think um, you're a scholar, you study the, the history and the practice yeah. um, from like, uh, as you said, it's like a, a semi-objective perspective. Let's, yeah. let's be real, there's no such thing as objective, even exactly. in science. So <laughs> it's just collective subjectivity. Uh, <laughs> um, yep. But yeah, I, I really appreciate how open you are in where you are, wh where you stand and your experience. And um, I think how we're carrying this interview from like such a personal you know, perspective, it, it's actually teaching the viewers um what scholarship is. what i meant to say is estelle's personal road through her studies led her to this specific type of scholarship in religious studies i, tr I try to 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 kind of draw this border between uh, my personal and professional life and i found that um as that border is kind of blurred that boundary is blurred I'm just, I'm just getting comfortable with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, times when I'm asked in my personal life to offer my kind of scholarly perspective or expertise, you know, mm -hmm. I'm okay with blurring that line and mm -hmm. vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I'm asked in in academic spaces, you know, what the community thinks, and and I hate being like the. <laughs> The, the the speaker for my community because like I'm like yo my 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 community is so diverse exactly know, there's so many Pacific Islands. there's so many yeah, different colors exactly. you know um, and and we all have different experiences and I think I was talking with one of my um, friends who he was an undergrad at Stanford and, and graduated a couple of years ago and he's a half caste right and so oh, wow. mm -hmm. um, we're talking about kind of like these issues that half caste I kids are dealing with in terms of identity and i told him i said you know my kids i think of my nieces and nephews are the only full tongue kids wow. all of my nieces and nephews are half caste and they're mixed with a bunch of different like filipino white mexican you know what i mean like exactly. and i don't i have no clue what's going to happen for them and you know what the sentiment of, among full tongue versus half caste yeah. kids might be among third and fourth generation Tongan American. Um, it'll be interesting to see, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, you know, and, 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 and mm -hmm. so like the community is not monochromatic and we're also not stagnant, right? Exactly. We're not static and it's always continuously changing. And so, mm -hmm. um, exactly. so yeah, which means like, there's always going to be work to do. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. That's so you're opening up like future research for your PhD students in the future. If you choose to go into academia, question mark. For sure, yeah. Okay, I, I, right. <laughs> I'm choosing to go into academia, wow. yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And can you talk about your um, recent publication co-authored with, I hope I, I say their name properly, Fina Sin, Sino, Sinatovo? Um, yeah. Man of Classroom, yeah. Man of Classroom as a Sacred Space. Uh, tell us about your research methods. This is what I want to understand, like, the mechanics of, like, how do you carry out a research project in religious studies? So, yeah, talk about the research and then how, also how you went about getting the data to, you know, speak on this subject matter. Yeah, so I think <laughs> this all came about um, after I got lectured for Final Sinatobo um, at the College of San Mateo. And I had just started realizing 
that when I brought up that I my work is in religious studies, that the students kind of wanted to talk about religion, but also forefronted their religion uh, whenever I asked them to introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if there was an introduction, like where they're from in Tonga, like the villages that they come from, the church that they went to, mm -hmm. right? Or what um, religious belief that they um, <clears throat> um, prescribed to, and then where they stay in the Bay Area. Um, when I when we talked about their learning experiences, they also forefronted um, the kind of um, the sacred aspects of the mono learning community spaces. Mm -hmm. And so in the classroom, you know, um, some of the some of the the comments that they were making is, you know, um, like God wouldn't put them in this space if it wasn't meant for them to, you know, thrive and succeed or something like that. And um, the prayers of their parents, you know, are what continue to um, encourage them to find success and X, Y, and Z. And it, all, it was always kind of that religious, religious language um, that, the, that the students chose to use to um, define kind of what success was, but also to define their journey um, mm -hmm. to finding success or whatever it was. And so then Finau and I talked about, um, you know, sacred spaces and what sacred spaces meant. So, you know, in religious studies, um, uh, Victor Turner, he's like, you know, um, in, in, in um, uh, sociology, he, he talks about fiend spaces and also liminal spaces. So there's um, a demarcated like sacred space that has mm -hmm. sacred objects, sacred beliefs, rituals, and then a profane space that's like marked and does none of that. And then there's a space that he calls liminal space, you know, um, that happens kind of in the midst of someone, of a, of a ritual, ritual to the end of the room, that's been, um, or that's what he calls the liminal, liminality. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we were talking, I gave the students like kind of reading about um, liminal space. Mm -hmm. And I also gave them um, this reading about lived religion. Um, and it's it was a, 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 a an excerpt from uh, Onaje Woodbine's um, um, Gods of the Black Gods of the Asphalt about street basketball as mm. lived religion. Wow. And in that book, Onaje Woodbine talks about um, kind of the sacrality of the basketball court and the ritual that the the basketball players, the street ball players, are participating. Anyway, so like I had the students read this and like kind of they, it really resonated with them. It really resonated with them. And um, most of the the data from the research that, that, that the, the project that we did was just kind of the comments from the students. And we asked them specific questions about how they understood um, the MANA learning space. And it was mm -hmm. always, almost all, almost all of the responses came um, through like this, like religious language is what we called it, right? And um, and we just, I think, just because me and now we're both Tongan, mm -hmm. and so we had an inkling about like how the students would respond to this. Um, there's a certain way that Tongans respond to to questions of that sort, right? Like mm -hmm. you always first and foremost give to God. Like mm -hmm. if you don't give to God. In the first sentence that you in your acceptance speech or something, then that's like you're not following Tongan protocol oh, and wow. the kids following Tongan <laughs> protocol to the team, right? Yes. Um, and so we were kind of seeing this, you know, regimented kind of structure of how the kids were, or I keep calling them kids, sorry, how the students were responding to the questions that we asked. And um, and I think in a way we're writing a second paper, a second half to this paper yes. um, in in the um, Tongan Research Association for this year. And I think in a way we're we're arguing that there is um, a certain like regimented structure that the, the students are following and we're trying to like identify what that structure is. Mm -hmm. We didn't really identify it in the first paper. We're just saying that there exists, there's a structure mm -hmm. that exists. And then I think in this paper, we're gonna dive a little deeper mm -hmm. to identify, um, you know, the, the, uh, com the properties of that structure. Okay, so um, you're, you is, like, Oh, yeah, continue. Sorry, I, I cut you off. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say in this last paper, it's um, like scaffolding to like yeah. show that this this structure exists. And then 
um, I guess the, the following paper would be more, that's when you produce the, like, the theoretical aspect, I guess. It's an interpretive study. Yeah. It, it is an interpretive study. Um, I think I'm, so she's out of the school, like the, the school of ed, mm. and then I'm in religious studies. And so we're trying to merge the two. Okay. And I think the, the most success that we've found in merging like kind of two different fields of like theories and methods is going with Tongan theory and method. Oh. And uh, which is really interesting. Right? What is that? What and is so, that? Um, so we're looking at the Tongan of socio speciality, uh, which is the Tava theory of, um, of reality. Okay. And that's a, a, a term coined by um, Dr. Augustino Mahina and um, and then elaborated on by Dr. Div uh, Divita Kai. And so um, Tongans don't necessarily, uh, we can't say like uh, Tong like uh, Tongans understand like um, uh, time in a, in a chronological sense, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> social relationships between people, between people and things, between people and places, between people and ideas are, are what, are how we measure things. Okay. Like so, we don't necessarily measure things by chronological chronological time. We we measure them by time space, okay. the time of the actual interaction, and then the space between the person. And so, like, there's this thing that we call in Donga this idea of Tauhiva, which is nurturing the space. Mm -hmm. And so, we're constantly nurturing space between us and other people, us and ideas, us and um, physical things, um, the land, the floor, the fauna. And, um, and so it's like really stepping outside of this like chronological um, concept of time and then stepping into the, the, the nourishment of space. Oh, okay. And so that's kind of what takes precedence in understanding Tongan studies or Tongan, um, well, we're still coming up with the terminology. And so it's like, all of this is kind of new. Um, and I think this is all still, still very, very, Young. I mean, it's not new in the sense that like we've never known anything about it. It's it's trying to put words um, to articulate it. Yeah. Yes, trying to articulate this in a way that other academics might um, understand it. Exactly. Because I think when we talk about it amongst you know just Tongans talking about this amongst Tongans, we understand when we say Tauhiva, we get that you know, mm -hmm. and there's not much more you need to say about it. And so it's just trying to really find a way to articulate that for our academic audiences. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, so that's, that's what we found works. We found that um, choosing like Solor Tsano's, um, I, she comes with like, you know, kind of this um, critical methodology from Ed. And then I'm looking and criticizing kind of like Turner's, um, theory of liminality mm -hmm. of um, sacred <clears throat> ritual, and um, and we're just trying to to figure out why that doesn't work for um, the Tongan the Mono learning community and the Tongan students in Mono learning community, and why Tava or Tawhiba works. works better to understand what's happening in that space. Love and that. Sorry, that was a really long winded. No, answer no, to no, no. It's it's cool. It's all cool. Um, and it's also telling telling us how how I was trying to say here is Esteli walks us through how interpretive and social study theories help us to understand the human experience in a more relatable way. I'm not a, um, in the humanities, so like the, the terminology is not, <laughs> it's, it's harder for me, but um, I'm very interested and in I the humanities. It's hard because I think like um, for her, she's coming out of this very like regimented, this is a qualitative study and X, Y, and Z. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't work with data like that mm. in, in uh, my humanities department. Yeah. And and so when she comes and she's like, oh, we have to do this and that. And I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> I, I'm good for just oral history. With, yeah. you know, uh, I'm okay with that. And mm -hmm. and so I'm learning a lot from her too, which is mm -hmm. great. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Wow. Well, I mean, it opens up doors um, for collaborations in the future. If you can, if you can, 
speak not necessarily the same language, but find that bridge. I think it also helps. I mean, you know, in terms of like those in ed, um, if high school teachers are reading about their Pacific Islander students, their Tongan students, and the ways to um, help them achieve academic success, it would have to be not necessarily teaching the teaching the the the, the teachers to somehow bring religion into their curriculum, mm -hmm. but helping them to understand why uh, Tongan students might not see themselves as successful or they might not understand the space as accommodating because like there's a separation of church and state. You're not supposed to um, oh. like preach in a classroom. Whereas like for Tongan students, you know, they if they're understanding themselves through like this lens of Christianity, and they're in a space where Christianity is like absolutely like ultimately like rejected, they don't feel a part of that space. They don't exactly. feel comfortable in that space. It's not accommodating. Hmm. And so if teachers know this, then I, then I'll at least know like why some students, some Tongan students might feel disconnected, right? Exactly. Um, and so that's kind of like the power that this these types of studies have is to not necessarily like give the students insight into you know what they're dealing with because they know what they're dealing with mm -hmm. it's to give educators insight into what type of backgrounds what type of accommodations that their students might need um, when mm -hmm. they come into those spaces so so yeah wow That's, i love that um and you just answered you've been answering all the questions <laughs> <laughs> Like you, you've just answered the importance of, of um, um, religious scholarship um, in in that last portion right there. Um, you're doing all the work for me. I love when <laughs> <laughs> I love when that happens. All right, so I'm gonna go into the last um, question of the interview, mm -hmm. which I I always love. Um, so what misconceptions of graduate school would you like to dispel for the viewers? I would say like the biggest one for me that I've learned is having a family in graduate school is not academic suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say that twice because yeah. I've had two kids. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was I was so um, afraid to tell my department that I was pregnant the first time. Mm -hmm. um, partly because of the stigma. The stigma mm -hmm. is like you cannot have a kid in graduate study and still be taken seriously, especially as a woman. Um, you're going to delay your time to degree. You're going to be wasting the department's money. Um, you won't have enough time to commit to your studies and you won't be um, doing academically rigorous work like mm -hmm. because you got to feed a baby or change a diaper or whatever. And that's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not academic suicide. There are ways that you as a graduate student can um, find allies, find support, and find mm -hmm. resources in the department. So um, from the time that I got pregnant with my first daughter, um, I had learned several very valuable lessons mm -hmm. about um, how to navigate that shame and that stigma that I was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and it was always through supportive people in yeah. the department. And so um, the supportive people pointed me to um, Stanford Resources for um, graduate student mothers, graduate student parents. And then um, in my fourth year, um, a bunch of wonderful graduate students agitated, agitated Stanford administration to uh, provide extra um, support. Uh, financial resources, yeah. financial support for graduate uh, parents, Yes, which is amazing. And I don't even know if all of those graduate students were even parents. Wow. But they agitated and then they got, you know, they got us what we needed. Yeah. Yeah. I will say that, um, yeah, graduate, yeah, for in graduate study, um, becoming a parent is not academic suicide. Um, it, it, it may prolong your time to degree, but who cares? In Paris, uh, as long as you get to yeah, <laughs> the degree. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
and 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 you'll be surprised. I I didn't know that my department would be so accommodating with my kids. Like, mm -hmm. I brought my first daughter with me on campus for a year. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was supposed to become her caretaker, but then she got bitten by a police dog. Oh no! Um, but my mama know she's nosy. She's nosy. So. <laughs> The police were looking for somebody in the neighborhood, and there she go, hearing the dogs and all the commotion outside. She went, open the door, and here goes the police dog. Like, if she wouldn't have been so nosy and kept oh, that door closed, <laughs> that police dog would not have ran in and been there. So sorry, Estelle's mom. I trust that you recovered and are well now. Um, I'm so sorry that uh, that happened to you. Okay, back to the interview. Oh no! <laughs> but yeah, so she was. It was. It. I mean, it was. It wasn't funny at the time, yeah, but now but I give no, it. Time. Yeah. But um, yeah. Sorry. So she was. She was actually bit that. That happened when she had my daughter for like the second week oh. while I was on campus, mm -hmm. and so I had to leave in the middle of my theories and methods class mm. and jam back home to like pick up my daughter from the neighbor's house, mm -hmm. check on my mom. Mm -hmm. She was in the ER. And so uh, my mom couldn't take care of her anymore uh, because she was recovering from that. And yeah. everyone on campus was just like, you know what, bring that baby, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And so um, there's, in my department, there's the, the, the Buddhist, the Buddha, the host center for Buddhist studies, mm -hmm. um, like in our department, and the administrators in that <laughs> in that office are so amazing. They're like, "Bring that baby. You go to class. Aww. We're gonna just play with her for an hour." I and love that. Yeah, it was so amazing. They would like my my daughter is obsessed with Peppa Pig now because they would play <laughs> Peppa Pig for her Aww. every day. <laughs> they would give her junk and cookies. They're the mm -hmm. most amazing um, group of people. And then. Yeah. I had some awesome friends who would, when I would have to uh, lead discussion TA and things on um, on Fridays, my friend would like know that I was running late. She would meet me at the classroom and grab the stroller and take off running towards um, the department where the awesome women at the, uh, the host center for Buddhist studies were waiting with junk and Peppa Pig for my. Oh, so, that's so sweet. Yeah, I love it was that. awesome. And, and I know, even if you don't find that supportive network, even if you don't find that supportive network inside your department, it's there at Stanford. And um, I was told about like the, the the nursing graduate mothers of Stanford, like they had kind of like a, I don't know if it was a Facebook page, but I think they had a listserv. They also had like a, a mapped out kind of where mm. nursing rooms were all throughout mm. campus. Um, and there's one in the foreign language department or that building um, because I used to use it there. It was awesome. CCR oh. <laughs> SRE was yes. freaking amazing. Um, they always let me use their lounge uh, mm. when I had class there. And I had like a three hour seminar. And so I would have to take a break to nurse and they would always like, here's an extra pillow, Aww. sit on the couch, you know, we'll close this part off so you can have some privacy. They were so amazing. And so, mm. you know, even if your department's not, um, super supportive. You'll find support. You'll find support. Yeah. It's, yeah. And That's you'll get so through it. Yeah. yeah. It's not academic suicide. <laughs> wow. All right. So thank you for um, sharing this time with me for this wonderful um, interview. I can't wait to um, see the final uh, product. And um, until next time, hopefully I get to meet you in person. It's all been virtual I this know. year. I, know. <laughs> me too. Yeah. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been so much fun of having mm -hmm. conversations with you and like in class. But yes. like, this is so cool. Like for Aww. sure. We have to do this with drinks in person. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Okay, all right. See okay, you. Adam. Bye. Hello, everyone. Bye. Thank you for watching part two of my interview with PhD candidate at Stanford in the Religious Studies Department, Esteli Kapoka. Please like and subscribe to the channel. That helps me to advance this platform. Every subscription, every like, and every comment helps me so much. So please support this channel. It's been a uh, labor of love. I enjoy doing it. It fulfills uh, a lot of my, you know, motivations to advance 
um, education in the United States and internationally. So please like, subscribe, and stay tuned for next week for more amazing content. See you.